it's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, it's Ron Slee. If this is your first volume, welcome. This is a weekly series where I go inside the mind of an entrepreneur, artist, athlete, academic to decipher what is the psychology of our decisions. I'm Australian and I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and community. I pay my respects to them and their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging of the land I am standing on today. I extend my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who listen to this. Today, we go inside the mind of someone that has been inside solitary confinement. Today, we are talking with... Hello, my name is Klaus Martin, you've reached the Department of Water Vehicles. How can I help you? Well, just kidding. Uh, We're actually talking with... So my name is Klaus Marte. I'm the CEO and founder of Combody, and I'm also executive director at Second Chance Studios. What I do at Combody is I hire people coming out of the prison system to teach fitness classes. And at Second Chance Studios, we train formerly incarcerated people to become experts in audio engineering, podcasting, and we're going to start that this year, uh, the end of this year. And I hope you know it's a, it's a success. That first part where Koss introduces himself as working for the Department of Motor Vehicles was actually how he used to introduce himself eight hours a day, every day, every week while he was in jail, working for seven cents an hour. If there was government that has access to that kind of slave labor, it is right here and they're doing it in broad daylight. Because when it says made in America, well, when it says made in America, is made in a prison. But more about that later. Here is a little bit of an insight to the type of entrepreneur we are talking with today. And like most entrepreneurs, he got into it because of the money. Today, I'm not that. I'm hungry. I'm hungry more for the hustle and for the change and for the cause. Uh, I don't think money is going to bring me happiness. I think that's the last thing that brings you happiness. Um, you know, because when I when I started selling drugs and made a lot of money at 19, I was making over $2 million a year. I, I changed the way we sold drugs in my neighborhood and, and a lot of parts of New York, and then other people started copying me. Um, it was a pretty significant case that the federal agents saw as a surprise when I was 23, and they caught me, and they're like, how the hell did you do this when they saw that? Everybody that was working with me was over 40 and 50. And, uh, and they were like, yeah, you're, you're running a crazy ring and you've got these older guys like respecting you and driving for you and doing things for you and all. And, but I think people respected me because I, I was just hungry and, I, and this hustle didn't stop. I was up for three days, 24 hour days. And, and then, like, I was just hungry. Like if, if somebody needed a bag, you know, a hundred blocks away, I'll be there in five minutes and, and I'll be there to deliver it on time professionally and you got to feel safe about it. So that was my, my, my whole thing. And, um, and then I went into prison. Did you know that one in five people incarcerated in US prisons have been sentenced due to drug offenses? Around 450,000 people are in prison for nonviolent drug crimes on any given day. So... Cos Marte has lived a life a lot of us have the luxury of commenting on from the couch while we watch Netflix. And context is everything because Cos Marte ran a multi-million dollar business with more than 20 people reporting to him with marketing, delivery, and customer service. It just happened to be for a banned substance. By the way, for context, marijuana has been a banned substance in the United States for a while until very recently. In fact, now it is legal because it is taxed, I suppose. And during the worst pandemic in our history, COVID-19, when everything else was shut, it is now today classified as an essential service in some states, even though there are still people in jail for being in possession or selling them at one point. 
that is just perspective. And questions that we have to just ask ourselves are these questions. But enough about that. Koss, how did you make this all work? How did the operation go down? So basically how it worked, I had a, back in the day, we didn't have like iPhones or anything, you know, actually like maybe, no, we didn't have even an iPhone. So everything was just flip phones. Um, And my, one of my dispatchers, so I had a dispatcher, I had uh, about 10 to 12 drivers each shift, you know, they were working 12 hour shifts. Um, And my dispatcher, I had two dispatchers, one of them went behind my back and uh, started a new phone. And so we had seven cell phones. Each phone only held 1,200, I mean, 1,500 to 2,500 contact numbers each. And uh, and he went behind my back to try to steal a couple of my customers and he started a new business card. So we were selling Coke and weed with a business card that we was giving out to young professionals. And we were doing this for years and we didn't get caught. We were doing like very, very low key, very lucrative. And, um, and he decided to start trying to steal my customers. I found out that one of my customers got one of his cards and got a different product. And he was like, this is not a good product. They gave me something different. This is usually what you have, you know, is good. And it was like an old client that had my phone number because I didn't, none of my clients had my number, but this guy had my personal number. So he called me and tells me this. And he was like, by the way, do you have somebody gave me a new card? And I'm like, what do you mean? What's the number on it? And so he gave me the number and I called that number and I heard my dispatcher pick up. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Excuse my language. And he was like, I just heard his like, like, oh, and like blank and, uh, and hung up the call. So I quickly went to, we had a connection in like T-Mobile store. We were or, and like Boost Mobile. We was using like a lot of prepaid phones. So I go over there. I switched all the numbers. I actually got a connection to get that number that I called and took that phone number away from him. And so I got that number and and this guy, like, we went to the stash house. He, like, ran away with drugs and money and all these other stuff. So we took a loss and disappeared. And so I'm operating with this new phone number that he, you know, he, did, he started giving out clients' cards. So I'm thinking, like, maybe my clients have that phone number um, you know he's trying to steal my customers and so we kept working with that phone not knowing that that phone was being tapped by fed so he gave his card out to a federal agent and uh, now i'm sending my workers to these federal agents and they're buying drugs one at a time and they have this whole long paper trail uh they had about 45 sales in the last year and then uh, and then when they caught me um, they I, they caught me coming out of the stash house, and so they had a warrant for my house. And then I like walked out, and uh, they just basically bombarded me, and um, and and they brought me back in the house. And it was like, "Where's the drugs?" And I was like, "I don't know what you're talking about. I don't sell drugs. I don't, you know, who the hell are you?" Blah blah blah. I was just playing like, "No, no, no, no." And they were like, "Don't don't worry. We know everything." And they went exactly where the drug stash was and there was only three people that knew and uh, and i narrowed down who the hell uh told them um and it was one of my drivers and he basically told them everything everything and uh and that was it and 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 then i was sentenced to seven years in prison We get that a lot too, like why why does there have to be a service for Aboriginal people specifically? And the, and it's the facts. The facts are that Aboriginal people are, you know, overrepresented in the justice system. Hi, Michelle. It's Elva here from the Aboriginal Legal Service. How are you going? Good. How are you? Oh, yeah, not too bad. <laughs> you sound so happy. Oh, a bit busy. It's busy, but it's not too bad. I think they're in interview. Give me two seconds, all right? No worries. Are you looking for a career? Are you there? Yeah, yeah. They're in interview at the moment. Can I get them to buzz you back after they're finished? No worries. Bye. Bye. The problem with that is that if they're interviewing them straight away, we're not then they don't have access to legal advice before their interview. 
That's a problem. Do you understand why you're at the police station? Uh, yeah, I have a fair, yeah. Yeah? Do you have any family members you want me to contact? Yeah, probably my nan. Also, did you want some legal advice regards to your interview? Um, yeah, that'd be great, yeah. Alright. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to put you through to... I haven't been able to get in contact with anyone, like, even the man that I'm here. Right. <laughs> so, have you used or anything today? Are you under the influence of anything at the moment? Huh. Okay. So, you're having withdrawals or anything else? Yeah, last time I used was two days ago. Okay, so it's been a few days. Oh, okay, so he's sobered up? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did he want to speak with us at all, do you know? Um, he's not fit for interview at the moment because apparently he's too drunk, so he's been lost. Oh, no worries. We'll call back in about four hours, see how he's going. Okay. That was part of a report done by Vice. If you take a step back and look at the big picture, it is hard to ignore the connection of all the dots. In Australia, this is a problem and a big problem. And the problem with the system, especially here in Australia, is that once you're part of it, you are blacklisted for life. I wonder why it isn't called whitelisted. But... I've heard this a lot. Once someone does something, the chances of them doing it again is high. Well, in full transparency, I know that I have been caught for drink driving. I went to court and because I didn't have a single other traffic violation, I was given a work license and a hefty fine. I will never drink and drive again. In fact, the last time I even drank any alcohol was over a year ago. If we call our prisons correctional facilities, then why treat people going through correction the same way once they get out? If they are still a threat to society, doesn't that mean that you aren't doing your job? I've never been of the opinion that the government will solve anything. I believe that the entrepreneurs are the ones that are going to solve the biggest problems in the world. And costs, well, costs is killing it at the moment with multiple businesses and he's doing it all for a reason yeah i mean we want to raise voices we want to give opportunities so secondchancestudios.org um and so if anybody wants to become a mentor they could sign up there you could donate to our cause um we want to train people that have been coming out of this system uh to be more technical and start their own podcast start you know, learning more technical skills like audio engineering, video production and stuff. So the the problem that we have in America is that most people and, and different parts that have been in the UK and seen like their prison system, most people that come out of the prison system have no technical skills and no one's really showing them anything of that nature. You know, what we aspire and they tell us to do is like, Oh, we'll give you a food certificate so you could go uh, get a dishwashing job and maybe you could become a, you know, a server or, or you could go into construction and we'll give you a certification, you know, how to build scaffolding. Um, not everybody wants to swing a hammer for the rest of their lives. And I think not a lot of people could swing a hammer for the rest of their lives. Like it's very difficult and it takes a lot of strain on your body. Uh, and then on the, on the other sense is that most people, you know, in terms of like COVID you know, hit, anybody that had those manual labor jobs, they were done. Anybody that could do anything virtually on a computer, we still, we're still surviving. You know what I mean? So that's the opportunity that I want to give for people coming out of the prison system. We're going to take 12 fellows who are going to go to our program starting in January. We're going to educate them in audio engineering, podcasting, video production work and we're going to train them in a technical way so they could live a sustainable life whether it's through the internet or in person uh and that's and that's the goal uh and get them you know maybe a career in you know maybe working in spotify because most people that look like me or been through my situation probably are not working there so we want to crack that that door open we already have uh, uh, having conversation with Vice, um, so they could hire our fellows. We're having conversations with with the Moth, which is a a huge huge podcast over here. But they they're they're doing a six week workshop for our, all our fellows to do a, a how to speak, how to present a workshop, which is going to be incredible for us. 
Uh, so yeah, I mean, I hope Ronsley, you can bring your team and they can educate us on, on the more technical uh, aspects of the field so we can get these guys and, and ladies that are coming out of the system a, substan- a substantial job. I, I wouldn't even call it a job because somebody, when I came out of prison and somebody said, uh, do you want a job? And, and I was like, yeah, I want a job. He's like, you don't want a job because job is a journey onto brokenness. You want a career. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, I want a career. And, uh, and they were like, you don't want a regular old, you know, flipping burger type of job. You know, that's not going to get you anywhere. You want something that's going to be sustainable and give you life. And so that's what we want to do with fellows graduate our program. When we come back, the unfairness that is already just part of the system. The main objective of this audio project is to bring together entrepreneurs and creatives who share similar values so that they can find the courage to put out their authentic voice for the right people to hear, which allows for them to make their impact on the world. Every great movement started with a memorable speech. For access to full-length interviews, go to psychologyofentrepreneurship.com and click the button. Two months before Koss was about to be released. Well, I'll let him tell you. You know, the, the unfairness that happened to me, I was, I was two, two months towards my incarceration, like free freedom and ending my incarceration. And uh, I get called down to the medical unit by this officer. And I, I'm walking down to the medical unit thinking I'm going to see a dentist because I, I, I've been waiting for, to see a dentist for three years. So I'm, I'm excited to go down. I'm like, I'm two months away. I'm getting my teeth cleaned. And um, I get down there and this officer places me on the wall and starts searching me. Um, and as he's searching me, he started searching me very aggressively. And, and I felt very uncomfortable that he was going in between my legs and like we, you know, m- making me feel uncomfortable. And, and it was not even like, like, uh, uh, you know, when you react, you like have time to react and think it was just like a natural reaction where I like just shifted my body as he went in between my legs. And, um, and he punched me behind my head and he said, today's not my day. Don't fuck with me. And, I uh, and I remember he knocked, like he, I saw black and blue. Like I just saw, you know, when, when somebody knocks you out, you're like, in the days and I got back up and I turned around and I turned around on the officer and he thought I was going to attack him. So he presses this, this pin, they call it uh they call it a pin, but it's a walkie talkie that they have and, and all correctional officers have. And once that button is pressed, um, the whole alarm for the whole prison goes off and about a half a dozen officers come to the scene and they beat the crap out of me. And they, they dragged me to the solitary confinement after they cuffed me up. And in that moment, I just felt hopeless when I'm in that cell. And so I got, I got this officer that came up to my door and he passes me a paper a pen and an envelope. And I quickly grabbed that and I'm like, all right, this is what I really need to do. Um, and I think that's where the entrepreneurial mindset comes into play. Like you still have that little hope, you know, like, you're going to figure this shit out, you know? So, I like grabbed that piece of paper. I started writing my family and letting them know, you know, I'm in this situation. This officer's trying to set me up. I need a lawyer. Get me out of here. I'm going to, you know, write to different parts of the state to fight this case, blah, blah, blah. Because now I'm facing three more years in prison behind this situation. And then I realized I had no stamps to send out this letter with. And so I started banging my head on the wall. I like literally sat down on my, my mattress and um, I'm just like, banging in my head because I'm like, don't know what to do. And I'm just so stressed out. And, and I, I didn't even cry. I was, I just had anger. It was just like, um, I, I was so frustrated and it was over a hundred degrees in that cell. There's no AC, there's no fan, you know, there's, there's, you, you to breathe, to try to even get some, some type of, there's a cell door and you have this crack and you're just like sticking your nose right there because there's where you get the best fresh air. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And it was not until like probably three or four days later when my sister finds out I'm in solitary because I was constantly calling home and and my sister was somebody I was communicating with a lot. And she writes me and, and tells me uh, we found out you're in solitary. Um, you know, just all I want you to do is pray Psalm 91. And I'm like, fuck God, fuck Jesus. I don't need that. Like, that's just my mindset. I'm like, I was not a religious person. My sister's like Mother Teresa's child type of person. And uh, she had me, she gave me this Bible um, early on in my incarceration, never really opened it up. I used it to take notes and my boys that were leaving out of prison, I wrote their numbers. And so that was the only reason I used it. And uh, and out of boredom, I was in 24-hour lockdown, sweating balls, and I'm like, you know, I got nothing else to do. So I, I pick up the Bible and I, I find Psalm 91. And, and which states, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my fortress and my uh, my God. And so I, I, as soon as I, I I started reading those words, a stamp in between the Psalm pages, and I could tell because it was just like, you know, a couple pages back, um, a stamp fell out of the Bible. And uh, I felt I felt like chills run down my body. I felt like there was something bigger than myself at that moment. And it was, it was that little, the cheapest item that you could get, you know, that, that you know, to, the ironic thing is like, I, I cared about all this expensive stuff, cars, clothes, you know, houses, whatever, like, and the cheapest thing was the thing that woke me up, you know, like just a simple Santa that, that I thought would help me to communicate with my family, that, that gave me that hope, you know, and so I used that stamp and I sent that, that message out to my family. Um, and, and they were trying to help me, you know, going back and forth. And I, I eventually uh, ended up doing an extra year in prison behind that situation. When you hear that, how does that make you feel? How does it make you feel to right now have so much freedom and power that you've taken it all for granted? Because privilege and entitlement is an interesting set of blinders. And... Starving is not the same as hungry. I'm homeless for the next few months is not the same as going on a road trip. Toilet rolls are not in the basic needs. Those are food, water, shelter, maybe clothing. Being forced to wear a mask is not the same as being gassed to death in one of the worst tragedies in human history. When you use your words... Understand the privilege you have to do so. And if you haven't been homeless or starving or in Nazi Germany prison camps, you have no basis of comparisons to use that in your language. Sometimes you have no real way of making comparisons at all. Koss, what was it like growing up? My mindset what, as a kid was that I wanted money. I wanted to be rich. Uh, and I did any anything that I needed to do, whether it was negative or positive, mostly negative, you know, selling drugs and even breaking into apartments and cars and all this other all stupid stuff that I did while I was a kid. Um, you know, not, not even thinking that it was wrong at certain times. I was just like, you know, I, I was born in a situation and this is what I'm dealt with and this is how I got to deal with it, you know? So as a, as a kid, I, I, you know, I was, I was sharing this with somebody else today. I was like, cleaning cars uh one of my she was like what was one of your best memories as a kid i was like going down a corner and opening up a fire hydrant hose you know opening up a can of goya beans opening it up on both sides using that as like a like a harness to like just hold that and spray the cars down and then uh then i came up with the brilliant idea of putting like two dollars per car wash on a cardboard and I'm like standing there in front of cars, making them sure, you know, they stop, you know, I'm not crashing an eight year old kid. Uh, so I could clean that car and they would give them two bucks. So, you know, just spray them down. Um, and, and that's what, that's what it was. It was, it was, it was crazy, but yeah, I mean, that was my mentality. And I think it all derived from, uh, um, being deprived, uh, of things, uh, things that, that I think other kids, uh, have, you know, 
uh, or all the kids that I grew up around and, and in my building and my family members, like my mom and I lived on my aunt's couch. And um, just seeing like my cousin with the new Jordans and I'm asking my mom, you know, can I get some Jordans? And I yeah. couldn't get the Jordans because she was like, I, I can't afford it. You know, that was, that, that used to make me angry. And I'm like, I, I'm, I need these, like, I want this, you know? So that was a, a hunger of mine, like just to try to figure out a way to get it. Some of the most well-known entrepreneurs today started their journeys at a surprisingly young age. IKEA founder Inya Kamprad rode around his Swedish neighborhood at the age of six selling matches. He would buy matches in bulk and then sell them individually at a reasonable marked up price. He also started IKEA when he was just 19, so it's pretty safe to say he was just made to be an entrepreneur. Now with Conbody, Koss gets invited to fancy events and gatherings. And I wanted to know, what was it like for him to be in those situations now? To even walk into that room as a, as a person of, of color, and then the whole room is, is white, mostly white male. You know, to, to, to just see that, you know, uh, and, and these are entrepreneurs that have done amazing things, Come from some come from zero to, to 100, you know what I mean? But to walk in there and you're like, damn, why? I don't, I don't feel connected, you know? And, and so the, the, I don't feel like I could like talk to this guy and relate to him because he didn't grow up the same way I grew up. And then I, then I, I connected with this guy, George, who's an amazing person, worked with like Martin Luther, King, Martin Luther King back in the day and all that stuff. Yeah, and actually Martin Luther King's speech you know, when, when I met him and, and, and I just felt more comfortable because I knew he was part of that struggle and part of that discrimination and, and fought for that cause. Uh, there was another black guy that I reconnected with there, but you feel, you feel taken back when you walk in and I walk into so many boardrooms and so many meetings and places and, and events where I just see just nothing but white people. And it's just like, damn, where, where are my people? Most of them are locked up. It's that. So the reason for this whole volume was for you to understand that there are layers and underlying causes to everything. Perspective is the difference of asking a question from ignorance as opposed to an educated one. In the Constitution of America, there is an amendment called the 13th Amendment. Watch 13 on Netflix for more on that. But here is the amendment. It has two sections. Section 1. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section 2. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. That's a lot of jargon, but Koss explains this better. So there was a slave owner, you know, all the slave owners were white, all the slaves were black, um, you know, before slavery was abolished. And so all the black people picked all the cotton, did, worked all, on the fields. Now all the fl slaves are free. Who's picking up the cotton? The slave owners not used to picking up their own cotton. They're not going to go out there and pay anybody to do it. So they created the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment states the only way you could become a slave is you, if you're incarcerated again. And so if you're, you lock up people, that you have them work back in the fields. And so who are the people that they locked up? Black people, people of color. So they brought them back to the fields, and it became a systemic uh, thing that, that's happening today. Uh, for example, when I was incarcerated, I was working for the Department of Motor Vehicles. So if you wanted a license to drive a car, if you ne needed any type of information, you're speaking to an inmate inside prison as a customer service agent. We can't say that we're inmates. And so we're getting paid seven cents an hour. Uh, I was making $40 uh, a month uh, working eight hour shifts. And I'm like, hello, my name is Klaus Marte. You've reached the Department of Motor Vehicles. How can I help you? You know, a job that's getting paid out in the streets for $20, $25 an hour, like I'm getting paid 
seven, eight cents an hour, which is basically slave wages. Um, and, and you can't do anything with that. And so that's, that's what's happening. That's the reality. Like even Victoria's secret panties are being made in prisons, you know, like when it says made in America is made in a prison. So these big corporations are paying the, the prisons a larger amount. So they might be paying like somebody $5 an hour for their, their, la- their labor, but then the prison is pocketing that and profiting that. And we're only getting paid seven cents an hour. And so it says, why not continue, you know, locking people up uh, to make, to have this cheap labor. So wait, Americans working for slave labor, the government can't be in on this, can they? And if they are, wouldn't you consider that to be a systemic problem that needs to be addressed? Uh, on, on top of that is the government feeds these these prisons more money as they have more beds uh, locked. They have more people locked up. So the more people you have, the more funding you get from the government. Um, so basically, uh, a prison holds, let's say, two thousand inmates. Uh, if you lock up your full two thousand inmates, you you get you know, let's say, you know, $10 million for that budget that year or whatever. Um, You say you're going to be feeding these individuals, blah, blah, blah. But most of the profits are going to the the officers and, you know, lieutenants, captains, everybody that's working in that. They're getting bonuses. Um, So it's just, it's a sick, sick system. And and that's just a a little overview and, and just there's way more that's happening. Coming up on The Psychology of Entrepreneurship. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. You are founder, president, CEO, whatever, like of a four person company, then then it's either ego or multiple personality. Key takeaways for new managers is that success is that it's done 85% how you want it without you being involved. Because it never got better. Putting off that conversation or that decision never made it better or easier in the long run, only harder. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I interviewed Kos Mate because he is the founder of Conbody an exceptional business offering a unique fitness program from studios in New York and also online. Conbody is a prison-style fitness boot camp that hires formerly incarcerated individuals to teach fitness classes. Koss went from earning $2 million a year dealing drugs at 19 to doing time in prison from the age of 23, then starting a social enterprise which employs ex-offenders and gets them back on track. He is a warrior, a fighter, an entrepreneur, and a friend. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing, voiceovers, and sound design by Kaylee Bunnyman and Tiago Vega. Guest research and content by Claire Gould and Corinne Castles. Project managed by Kaylee Bunnyman. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Slivas. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Hey, it's Kaylee from Must Amplify. I'm the sound engineer for this volume of Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I'm part of the team that made this production come alive. I work as a part of a global team with our studios based in West End, Brisbane, Australia. If you would like a podcasting checklist, email me at kaylee at amplifyagency.media. That's K-A-I-L-I at amplifyagency.media. We specialize in finding your voice and making sure it's heard by the right people. If you are considering whether a podcast is a good idea for your business, check out our other show on shouldistartapodcast.com.